everyone, it's Hannah here from Virtually Fluent. Welcome to today's video, which is a long vocabulary boosting video about politics in English. I am going to describe the British political system. However, all of this vocabulary will be transferable to talk about politics in your own country and other political systems around the world. So let's get started with politics vocabulary in English. So the UK has one of the oldest parliaments in the world. Today it's officially recognised as a constitutional monarchy and this means that our sovereign, which is our king or queen, is our head of state but we do have a democratically elected government and they carry out the day-to-day -day running of our country. This is all set out in the Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights in 1689 and this limits the powers of the Crown within the United Kingdom but it allows freedom of speech and the passing and creating of legislation within our Parliament. This also enables the election, a general election, to take place every five years in the country. The head of the UK government is called the Prime Minister and our Prime Minister will select a cabinet which is a group of individual members of Parliament who then represent the largest public sectors and different industries across the country. Together the UK government and ministers hold both executive and legislative power. So this means that they can remove old laws, they can introduce new laws and they can ensure that laws that are set out in our country are upheld. Judiciary power, which prosecutes those who break the laws in the country, does not belong to the UK government. Instead, that belongs to an independent authority which upholds our court and legal system across the country. The UK government is housed in the Houses of Parliament down in London and Parliament consists of two separate chambers, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Now the upper chamber is the House of Lords and this is not an elected body of people. These are people who are widely recognised in their sector, in their industry, or perhaps have very high achievements within their sector and industry. And they represent that in the House of Lords. Their primary job is to ensure that the elected ministers, so those in the House of Commons, are upheld and they are carrying out their responsibilities correctly. Now the lower chamber, which is the House of Commons, is a democratically elected chamber. And our country is divided geographically into lots of little constituencies. And within each constituency, the British people would then vote for who they would like to be their representative, their member of parliament, also called MP, down in London in the House of Commons. Now the voting system here in the UK is called a first past the post system and that means that the party, the political party, with the largest number of representatives voted for in a general election has the right to form a government. Now of course it's much easier if you have a majority within the government I believe at the moment we have 650 constituencies. So if you have a majority over that 50%, 325 MPs, then it will be much easier for you to pass laws and push your policies through the Houses of Parliament. However, and this does happen occasionally, that there is no outright majority, no political party meets that 50% threshold. Therefore, they would need to work with other political parties try and make deals. This is called a hung parliament when we're in this situation and they would most likely need to enter an official coalition, an official deal with another political party so that they can sit in the Houses of Parliament and again try to push through their policies and legislation. Now of course each member of Parliament, each MP, does represent their local constituency so they generally try to bring forward local issues into the Houses of Parliament and push them into the national eye. A lot of MPs will hold local weekly meetings in their constituency so you can get to meet your local MP and you can bring forward any local issues they may be able to to try and resolve this or put the issue forward towards the government or hire people in 
the political party. However, the actual day-to-day -day running of a constituency and the local governing decisions, including recycling, including spending on the public in that area, instead that would be made by the local government, which is also voted for in a democratic election. Uh, that's slightly different and that is called the council. Now in the run-up to an actual general election or even some local by-elections, you would have the MPs and the candidates canvassing the area, which just means they're trying to sell their idea to you, perhaps knocking door to door, trying to speak to you or putting leaflets out uh, or phone calls perhaps in the local area. Now, of course, each political party in the UK would then have a leader, but these are not necessarily directly voted for by the British public. So, these are voted for instead by the members of a political party. These would be your sitting MPs, they would be donors to the party. In some political party cases, it would be trade unions. And it could be some members of the general public. Anyone can join the different political parties. You simply have to pay a small membership fee on an annual basis generally. And then you have the right to vote for the leader that you believe is the best person within your political party. However, at general elections, this does not necessarily mean that you are voting directly for the leader or the prime minister of the country. Instead, you are voting for your local representative and the political party party, the policies that you want to see pass through government. Now, each political party has their own set of rules and their own process for voting for different candidates, so they then become the leader of the political party. However, they also have the right to eliminate a leader of the party. As we've seen more recently here in the UK, if the members of a party don't believe that their, their leader, whether it's um, the prime minister at that point or leader of the opposition, Position, or simply a leader of a smaller political party, if they don't believe in them anymore, they can vote for a motion of no confidence. If that then expands and there is a majority that has no confidence in the leader, they would then have to leave their role. This could be because they've broken a law or a rule, or they simply don't believe that they're doing a good job, aren't the right person for the job uh, for the country at that point in time then they would leave their role. And each, again, each political party has their own separate rules for how a new person then takes over. If this happens in between general elections, of course, this means that you have never directly voted for the leader of the country or the leader of the opposition or smaller party at that time. Uh, in that case, those new leaders often tend to call for an early general election because they don't believe they have much of a mandate to run in office. Now, it is really important to note that what I've spoken about so far is the UK government, which is a centralized government. Now, here in the UK, our kingdom is made up of four separate countries. We have Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales and England. And Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales each have their own devolved governments which are separate and run in different ways to our centralised UK government. So let's take a little moment to chat about those. So if we start off with Scotland, they have the Scottish government and the Scottish people will vote for the Scottish government every five years, generally. Their particular system is called the Additional Member System, the AMS, and it's a proportional representation system, so different to that first-past-the-post system down here in centralised UK government. So the party with the largest number of MPs in Scotland would then run the Scottish government. The parliament itself sits in the capital city of Scotland, which is Edinburgh, and the leader of the Scottish government would be the First Minister. In Wales, you have an almost identical system to that of Scotland, so this would be called the Welsh Government. Again, the Welsh people vote for their Welsh Government every five years, generally. The Welsh Government and Parliament sit in the capital city of Wales, which is at Cardiff, also called the Senate in Welsh rather than Parliament. And the leader of the Welsh Government is also called the First Minister of Wales. Again, they have this AMS proportional representation system. So again, the party with the largest number of MPs through that system would then have the right to form a government in the Welsh Parliament.
Northern Ireland is a little bit different to both Scotland and Wales. They also have a proportional representation method and they are also voting for their minister every five years. However, this is called the STV, the Single Transferable Vote, and instead they create the Northern Ireland Executive. Now, interestingly, this is a jointly chaired government between the First Minister of Northern Ireland and the Deputy Minister of Northern Ireland. The person who takes the role as First Minister is the political party that wins the largest number of votes for MPs, in their their vote and the deputy minister the deputy first minister is then the leader of the second largest political party so you will always have these two political parties working together in the northern irish executive for the day-to-day -day running of the country. Each of these devolved countries will also have a Secretary of State, so somebody who sits on the cabinet of the UK government to represent those devolved countries. It's also really important to note here that because the systems work differently, the devolved governments and the centralized UK government, that you may have different representatives for each of those parliaments. So somebody who's voted for as a member of the Scottish parliament in the year 2000 might not be voted for in a general election as a member of parliament for their constituency down in the UK centralized government in the year 2002. So it's a very, very complicated power sharing system between the devolved governments and the UK, UK centralized government. But it doesn't matter if it's a devolved government vote, a UK centralized vote, a by-election, voting day is still the same process in all of these situations. So voting days typically are Thursdays here uh, across the UK and you can register to vote, and it's really important that you must register to vote in order to actually vote on polling day. Now the rules are you must be a British citizen, you must be an Irish or Commonwealth qualifying citizen, also resident here in the UK, or a British citizen who's living abroad, but you still have a registered address here in the UK within the last 15 years. And of course you must be 18 years or over on polling day here in order to vote. So there are three different ways that you can vote here in the UK. Most people would tend to vote in person, which is where you physically go to your local polling booth to vote yourself. You can also vote by post if you have registered for this. You will receive your voting card in the post and you simply must put your, your X in the box and send this off before the specific date given. And the final option is to vote by proxy. So you choose a representative you would like to vote in person for you because you cannot be there on the day. If you do decide to vote in person, then you will receive a postal notification a few weeks or potentially months before the vote and here you would on this postal notification be given the address of your local polling station and you would simply go down there on the day of the vote which the these polling stations tend to be open between 7 a.m and 10 p.m and um, then you would simply vote the way that you want in order to cast your vote at the ballot box here in the uk in the past you never used to need id you would simply state your name and your address to the registrar however this is in the process of changing. I believe a lot of areas do now require some ID and upon confirming that you would then be given your polling card. You can read through the list of candidates and put the X in the box of the candidate that you would like to vote for. Now on the polling card you would probably have around five or six different candidates, those from the largest political parties in the country but also some independent candidates too. Now anybody can stand as a candidate here in the UK provided that you are both resident and citizen here in the UK. There's a certain group of people that are not allowed to stand as candidates. For example, if you're in the police, if you work in the civil service, or if you have certain situations like a bankruptcy filing, then you would not be allowed to stand as a candidate. However, otherwise you can easily put your name forward and that would then appear at the ballot box. In that case, you would then be an independent candidate. However, if you would like to represent one of the largest political parties here in the UK, each political party has their their own particular process for applying, they would then narrow that down and choose their final candidate that they want to represent their political party at the ballot box 
at that time. Each political party can only put forward one candidate in the constituency and you would also need to pay £500 in order to put your name down. Uh, that would then be refunded back to you if you meet a certain threshold of votes. If you don't meet that threshold, then you would lose that money. So let's have a quick chat about the main political parties here in the UK. We have the Conservatives, also nicknamed the Tories, and these are generally right-wing political policies. Then you have the Labour Party, which is a left-wing political ideology. Slightly more central, you would have the Liberal Democrats. These are social liberal and they tend to change between right and left centralised policies. And then of course we have our national political parties too. You have the SNP of Scotland, the Scottish National Party. You have Plaid Cymru in Wales, a Welsh National Party. Then you have the DUP, Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland, as well as Sinn Féin of Northern Ireland. But as I said, you would have nominees from other very small political parties and also independents too. Now on election night, once the polls have closed, a lot of people would stay up through the night to actually watch the results come in. But as soon as the polls close at 10 p.m., most people are eagerly waiting for the exit poll, which is a prediction, a forecast of who the next government will be or how the political parties have done on voting day. One of the most accurate more recently has been by Professor John Curtis, which is released on the BBC, almost down to the exact number in some cases. There are, of course, millions of votes to count. So within each constituency, you would have hundreds of little polling stations for each individual ward, which is a smaller part within a constituency. All of those voting boxes, those big black ballot boxes, are then brought to one main hub within the constituency and local volunteers who are paid for the role and anyone can register for this are then counting the votes throughout the night because everything is done on paper here. Within the main hub, you would have TV cameras, you would have a lot of local reporters, of course the candidates themselves or perhaps representatives, people within each of the political parties wandering around overseeing the vote just to ensure that everything is running smoothly. Once all of the votes have been counted, if there is a clear majority, then a local election councillor who is just a neutral person will stand up and officially state the numbers of the votes and who will then be the MP for that constituency. If the numbers are extremely tight and a representative believes there has been uh, perhaps even a mistake, you can ask for an official recount. All of the votes would then be recounted or in some cases just sections to see whether that tallies up with the majority and that will be done before the local election councillor can actually call the name of the new MP forward. One of the most interesting votes to watch tends to be the race for the constituency that can get their MP read out first. This tends to be between both Newcastle and Sunderland. Very shortly after 10 p.m. you would see local students running around with those ballot boxes trying to get them to the main hub so that the count can come in and within a couple of hours that first MP is often declared. Of course the results are declared all the way through the night with MPs up to 650 of them being called all the way throughout the country. Remember our votes take place on a Thursday, so normally by Friday morning, occasionally Friday afternoon if there's been a huge amount of recounts, we would then know who most likely is going to be in government. Of course the new Prime Minister is going to be the leader of the largest political party. If there is a situation of a hung parliament or no clear majority, negotiations will go on for days, potentially weeks, before the official Prime Minister or UK government can then be announced. However, more recently we've had quite clear winners overnight for our Prime Minister and in that situation the old Prime Minister would then step outside 10 Downing Street, the official residence of our Prime Minister, 
They would then make their parting speech, typically listing out what they have done during their time as Prime Minister. They would then travel to see the Sovereign, which is our King or Queen, generally at Buckingham Palace, in order to be officially asked to disband their government, so basically stop being Prime Minister and UK government. Once this has happened, the new leader of the largest political party, so our to-be Prime Minister, would then also be uh, in front of the Sovereign and would be asked to officially create a UK government, which you would then uh, assume that they accept that position. They travel back from Buckingham Palace, typically, to 10 Downing Street, and they would make their first speech as Prime Minister. Now, in this first speech, they do tend to set out their immediate plan, potentially their 100-day plan, a list of policies and key things that they want to pass in the first few days as Prime Minister of the UK. Now, in those first couple of days of having our new Prime Minister, different MPs within that leading political party will come in and out the doors of 10 Downing Street, and this is because they are all being officially named or potentially being offered jobs as secretaries of state, so working within that cabinet, and they would take that title of Right Honourable. Within the first few days of Parliament being up and running, each MP, new or old, would then pledge their allegiance in the Houses of Parliament to both the country and the sovereign. They would take an oath that they would promise to do their job before actually sitting in Parliament in order to get on with the day-to-day -day running of our country. Now, the second largest political party after the vote would then be called the Opposition Party. The leader of that party is called the leader of the opposition, and they would also put together a cabinet called the Shadow Cabinet, ready to take over if anything ever happened to the sitting government. Primarily, once we have a Prime Minister and UK Cabinet and government in place, they would then get on with their jobs. Of course, they will be wanting to try and push through their agenda, their political agenda, which is either left-wing or right-wing political policies. These will be pushed through the parliament with majority votes, and these tend to be ideas that they sold on their manifesto when they were actually canvassing in order to try and become an MP. The UK government itself is actually upheld to a high standard by not just the UK cabinet, but all of the sitting MPs in the House of Commons and also in the House of Lords. So you have a lot of people ensuring that the leaders of this country are actually doing their job. Now, laws and policies can only pass with a majority vote here in the UK, and this is a majority vote not only by the House of Commons, but also the House of Lords, which we spoke about at the beginning of today's video. Now, a majority vote could be passed by the House of Commons. This then bounces to the House of Lords, and there is a possibility that they don't like that law or they want to make some adjustments to it. They can put forward some amendments. If that happens, it then goes back to the House of Commons. They would need to then vote again. So in some cases, it can take a long time for a law bouncing between House of Commons and House of Lords before it's actually passed and enforced in the country. The actual day-to-day -day running of our country doesn't necessarily happen by the doings of these MPs and House of Commons, House of Lords members, but instead by the civil service. So these are non-elected people who just complete the administrative work, they ensure that everything abides by the policies and laws that are passed by the government, and these are really the people that are keeping that country running and the day-to-day the -day, um, administrative tasks still go, no matter, still go on, no matter who is in government at the time. The UK government itself does have a rather large responsibility. They're, of course, in charge of taxes and public services and funding, whether it's cutting those or whether it's increasing those. They're also in charge of major policy and law changes, as well as granting and reducing power from different authorities around the country. So it is a huge responsibility that the UK government has. Public questions can be asked to the Prime Minister. We have PMQs, Prime Minister Questions, which take place on Wednesday afternoons weekly. And in this situation, local MPs can bring forward issues from their local constituents 
or they could bring forward larger issues of national concern, things they've seen in the media, and the Prime Minister will have to answer those questions. You can also have separate cross-party committees set up, which, as it says, is um, different members from different political parties working together on a committee to ensure that decisions being implemented across our country uh, by our government are the right things for the country. If an individual MP has broken a law or they have not uh, abided by a certain policy or they simply wanted to retire or due to a change of circumstance, they can step down from being an MP and this would then push forward a local by-election, which is the same voting process on a Thursday, etc., that we spoke about earlier, but it's just in one constituency to bring forward another MP just to ensure that each constituency always has a representative. So that was a, a bit of a mammoth vocabulary boosting video. Hopefully you've learned lots of new words to talk about political systems across the world so you can feel confident talking about politics in English. If you did learn something new, go ahead and give us a thumbs up, a like. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn those notifications on so you know exactly when we upload new English vocabulary, pronunciation, grammar, and um, life in the UK British culture videos. That's everything for today. This is Hannah from Virtually Fluent, bringing English to life.